Welcome for this evening. And obviously for the duration of our program, please feel free to uh, get up, get more food, get more drinks. We have plenty of all of it. Um, and it's, it's great to see everyone tonight. So, um, and I'm sure it's great to see so many people we haven't seen in a long time. So please feel free to continue eating, continue drinking, continue seeing folks you haven't seen. But we are gonna get started with our program. Uh, we have a very exciting uh, set, of, set of award winners tonight and we're excited to talk about the work that they've done in their careers. So my name is George Donnelly. I am the 2021 chair for the public interest section. Thanks, I didn't deserve that, but I appreciate it. It's a good start. Um, and it's a distinct honor to welcome you all here tonight to the public interest section's 30th anniversary celebration and annual awards ceremony. And like I said, we have a great program here tonight. It is headlined by our Bending the Arc Award winner, Meryl Zeeby. Where's Meryl? And by our Pollock Award winner, Judge Hefley, Judge Marilyn Hefley. Tonight, which is the section's first in-person event in uh, 20 months. We've had committee events in person, but a section-wide event in person we haven't had in 20 months. Tonight wouldn't be possible without the hard work of the Bar Association staff and community members. And I want to single out Tracy McCluskey from the Bar Association. Where's Tracy? For her incredible work organizing this and so many other events. And I also want to recognize Heather Hewlett and Melissa Mazur. Uh, Melissa's here this evening. Uh, where's Melissa? Where's Melissa? Melissa's right here who worked with me through several iterations of this program and of Public Interest Law Day more broadly. And speaking of Public Interest Law Day, I want to thank all of the participants today, but, es but especially Tara Phoenix for putting, together the, for putting together the technical aspects of the program and Margaret Zhang of the Women's Law Project, who for the third straight year organized the program. 30 years, that is how long this section has existed. And tonight I wanna to talk about the success of those 30 years and how we replicate that success going forward. Now, five, five minutes isn't long enough to go through every accomplishment. So as a proxy, I'm going to highlight the three Harrison Tweed Awards that the Bar Association has won largely due to the work of this section, but the three Tweed Awards out of five, five total, three in the past 30 years. And for context, the Tweed Award is the American Bar Association's award recognizing local and state bar associations that develop or significantly expand projects and programs to increase access to civil legal services. The Philadelphia Bar Association is the only five-time winner of the Tweed Award. So that's something worth applauding. So let's go back 25 years, 1996, the Philly Bar Association won for its effort in obtaining $2 million in state funding for legal services. This is from the ABA website, by the way, for sensitizing a key Senator about legal services. I have an idea who that Senator was um, and uh, that's, that was no small feat. In 2009, the association won for Judge Annette Rizzo's nationally renowned mortgage diversion program instituted at the height of the Great Recession. And 10 years later, I know Judge Wolf is in, is in attendance. We again won the tweed, this time for our right to counsel and eviction diversion efforts, um, a right to counsel for tenants facing eviction that serves as a national model today that is worth celebrating, that is worth applauding. And so in each decade of the past 30 years, this section, this community, identified and confronted some of the biggest challenges facing marginalized Philadelphians and successfully advocated for solutions. And this can only happen when a community is cohesive, strategic, and has continuity in membership. And so what do we need to do to make the next 30 years as successful or even more so? Well, 
My hypothesis is that the key to success within this community is the continuity of its members. Lawyers who have stayed active in the Philly public interest world or all, you know, for all or parts of the last 30 years. Just think about how many people in this room have been major parts of this community for years. And that is noteworthy because the sort of institutional knowledge and experience is key to improving our advocacy and litigation strategies on behalf of our clients. And therefore, we need to create the conditions now to ensure that young attorneys in our community stay in this community and stay involved. Okay, so how do we do that? It's a complicated question, right? But the biggest thing we can do is actually pretty simple. We can pay them. Now, this isn't a novel concept. Kathy Carr has been writing about it since the 90s. But when I talk to my fellow millennial attorneys about our professional lives, the underlying concern is rarely about dissatisfaction with their work. In fact, most people that I talk to adore their jobs. The thing that they're worried about is wondering if they can afford childcare, to buy a house, to have the capacity to care for older relatives, or have enough money for retirement. They are material concerns, not job satisfaction concerns. And so my charge tonight with so many funders in our community here, so many board members of our legacy organizations here, is that when we're making these strategic decisions in our organizations, is to prioritize paying the folks who are here now in this room, the folks already doing the work in municipal court, in family court, in referee hearings, in immigration court. Sometimes the most impactful thing we can do as a community is not necessarily expanding our footprint, but to ensure our folks doing the work continue to do the work. And look, I can read a 990. I know how difficult funding challenges are for nonprofit legal organizations and how no one in this room disagrees that we should pay our staffs more. But I urge us all to prioritize it in our strategic discussions this year and going forward. How can we ensure to make this career path sustainable for the next generation? Investing in our attorneys and our people from executive directors to managing attorneys, staff attorneys, paralegals, admin, comms professionals, investing in our people will ensure the continued success of this community for the next 30 years by keeping folks here in public interest roles. And of course, we're incredibly fortunate to have a bustling PI community amongst private practice lawyers, many of whom are here tonight. And the pro bono work done by private firms is invaluable. But the subject area experts, the people at our legal service organizations and civil rights orgs and public defender offices, they carry the work. They carry the advocacy, they are the subject matter experts, and they, we need to ensure that they are able to live comfortable, financially secure lives so they stay in their roles and continue to improve as advocates and continue to build the relationships necessary for successful long-term ad advocacy in an array of challenging fields, because that's how we will best serve our clients. That's how we will best advocate for marginalized communities throughout the city and the region. And that's how we continue to build towards a vision of a more just and more equitable society. And if we do that, we'll be back here in 2051 talking about the success of this community at our 60th anniversary celebration. And I look forward to being 64 years old at that celebration and being here with many of you. And so thank you all for indulging me. It's been an honor and a privilege to serve as the chair of this section this year. And with that, we'll go on with our program. So in an appropriate transition, I wanna welcome Pam Mertstock wolf up to help me um, announce the award winners and recognize the great work done by the next generation of public interest lawyers, our law students who are here this evening. The public interest section awards honor area law students who exemplify the pro bono ethic and who have worked tirelessly in support of social justice at their law schools and in their communities. 
The Law School Outreach Committee applauds the students honored here tonight and thanks the section for recognizing the students with this award. The committee also thanks the section and I wanna thank the folks in this section for mentoring, hiring and inspiring so many of our students beyond those being honored tonight. I have a uh, uh, dozen mentors in this room uh, this evening that started when I was a law, a law student. Um, I'm excited to announce our winners for this year. We have a great group, a market improvement from when I received this award 100 years ago. So um, looking forward to it. It's an incredible that these award winners were able to prioritize service while also serving, uh, while also handling the rigors of law school. So without further ado, when I call your name, please join us on stage and stay here until we've called all six awardees. First, we have Jay Gonzalez from Drexel. A Thomas R. Klein School of Law 3L, Jay Gonzalez has done extensive pro bono and public interest work with Mazzoni Legal Services, Delaware County District Attorney's Office, the Federal Reentry Court Program in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, and the pro bono team at Dwayne Morris. Lisa Laffend, Rutgers Law School. As founder of the Gender Affirming Name Change Petition Project and the Public Insurance Appeals Program and volunteer in several other pro bono efforts, Lisa has logged over 800 pro bono hours. Man, I haven't seen those numbers. I haven't seen those numbers since Margaret Zhang put up 800 pro bono hours in 2015. Um, Lisa co-founded the Disabled Law Students Association to advocate for herself and her disabled classmates and to bring attention to and educate future lawyers about an oft overlooked marginalized community and post-graduation plans. Lisa's going across the country. It includes a position with New Mexico Law Offices of the Public Defender in their Gallup location. So congratulations, Lisa. <laughs> Lena Ruth Doiker from Temple University, Beasley School of Law. Throughout her law school career, Lena has demonstrated her commitment to public interest work through internships in family law and immigration law, through guided research on non-uniformity of procedures in special immigrant juvenile proceedings, and through volunteering with community organizations such as Al Ultra Lado and the CAT Collaborative. Congratulations. Congratulations. Jordan Connell, University of Pennsylvania. Jordan is committed to pursuing a career in public service in Philadelphia that emphasizes economic justice and labor rights. At Penn, Jordan is involved with the Employment Advocacy Project, the National Lawyers Guild, Penn Law for Philly, and the Youth Advocacy Project. He also served as chair of the Democracy Law Project's Community Organizing Project. Congratulations, Jordan. <laughs> Antiana Fuller from Villanova University, Charles Widger School of Law. Antiana is a third year law student at Villanova and she is committed to working in child support reform and towards the elimination of the criminalization of poverty in America. Congratulations. <laughs> Alexa Dianudis, Alexa Dianudis from Widener University Delaware Law School. Uh, Alexa uh, may not have been able to join us this evening. But her decision to go to law school as a means to better serve the public was confirmed during her experience as a certified legal intern at Delaware Law School, where she represented survivors of domestic violence seeking civil protective orders. So congratulations, Alexa. And congratulations to all of our law student award winners.
You're almost done with me. Don't worry, I only got one more thing. Next, we have the announcement of our Schuster Fellows. The Morris M. Schuster Public Interest Fellowship Program provides educational loan repayment assistance in the form of forgivable loans to qualifying legal aid attorneys. Eligible attorneys must be employed full-time by nonprofit legal aid organizations receiving grants from the Bar Foundation. Practicing legal aid attorneys who have been employed at an organization for a minimum of three years may be eligible for up to $2,500. Those who have been in practice a minimum of five years, up to $5,000. In 2003, Morris Schuster recognized the burden that student loan obligations may represent for public interest attorneys. He established the fellowship as a mean to help legal services organizations funded by the Bar Foundation to attract and retain qualified attorneys and thereby help provide ongoing stability to our legal services system. And this year's fellows are, and if they're here, you can stand up. Joanna Vissera Joyan, Executive Director of the Youth Sentencing and Reentry Project. Farida Brewington from Women Against Abuse. Amy Lowenstein from the Pennsylvania Health Law Project. I know Kadeem's here. Kadeem Morris from Community Legal Services of Philadelphia. So congratulations to our Schuster Fellows. It is now a great honor to announce our, um, our award, the Bending the Arc Award, uh, to our friend, our colleague, Meryl Zeeby. Um, the Bending the Arc Award is the highest honor bestowed by the section. And it's awarded to a public interest advocate who has demonstrated achievement, resilience, and courage in their career. So Joe and Kathy are giving Meryl a proper introduction that she deserves, but I just want to quickly note. Meryl has been a mentor of mine since I was a 25-year-old law student presenting my research on eviction cases at DLSC. Um, and Meryl, I'll never forget you making a nervous kid feel welcome that day, and I am beyond thrilled that you are the deserved recipient of the Bending the Arc Award this evening. Presenting Meryl with the award are Joe Sullivan and Kathy Carr, who need no introduction themselves, but are here tonight in their roles with the Delivery of Legal Services Committee and the Access to Justice Task Force. Kathy, Joe. Thank you. Thank you, George, for the, your wonderful presentation so far. And um, I'm thrilled to be able to join Kathy Carr in, excuse me, in recognizing Meryl Zeeby. Meryl Zeeby is a force of nature, and that doesn't give full credit to who she really is and what she has done. So I'm going to recap some highlights very briefly, some of which George was kind enough to enunciate and announce earlier, but they're so important that I'm going to talk about them briefly anyway. Um, so um, since 2003, stop right there, since 2003, Meryl Zeeby has served as the public interest coordinator for the Philadelphia Bar Association. <clears throat> She's been responsible for providing staff and support for the Delivery of Legal Services Committee, which I've been privileged to co-chair with Anita Santos Singh who couldn't make it tonight, and Brian Kosluski, who was here earlier, um, which is our effort as a bar association to harness and enable the incredible work of the 30 plus public interest law centers that we have here in Philadelphia and that make us proud. Merrill has undertaken this with energy, with vigor, and with relentlessness for all of those years since 2003. In addition to the strategic direction and staff that support she's provided there, she has also supported our Civil Gideon and Access to Justice Task Force, which Kathy and I co-chair, which just celebrated its 10th anniversary. Um, and unlike the Delivery of Legal Services Committee, which is a powerhouse committee of public interest law center directors, and they are powerhouse directors, 
the task force is a collaboration with the judiciary uh, in which maybe, I don't know, half our members, at least half our members are judges, federal and state, who work collective, collaboratively with us to achieve things that, in my mind, could never have been achieved but for that collaboration. One of which has already been mentioned, which is the fact that Philadelphia is one of only five, was the fifth city in the United States to recognize a right to counsel for low-income tenants who cannot afford lawyers. Um, Merrill, uh, Merrill's um, hard work over all those years uh, reminds me of something that um, was already said, which is that the Philadelphia Bar Association was the first ever uh, winner of the ABA House and Tweed Award on five different occasions. So we hold that record as a five-time winner of a national award by the ABA recognizing truly, truly outstanding public interest work. And Merrill was key to mo most of that work, especially with the last three awards. Um, so uh, in addition, Merrill uh, led the task force's successful efforts in 2013 to secure an ABA grant uh, to fund the, um, I can't read my own printing here, the creation of the Pennsylvania Civil Legal Justice Coalition, which, in which we attempted essentially to expand the great work we've done in Philadelphia to the, the entire state of Pennsylvania. We're not there yet, but we're moving in the right direction and we're getting closer every day, every year to doing that. And Merrill, more than anybody else in the group that we've worked with said, we can do this. We're gonna get there, we're gonna do it, we're gonna make it happen. And Merrill is the person who reached out to all kinds of actors at every level, judges, lawyers, uh, bar officials, others to say, we've got to do this. In fact, the coalition that we put together was co-chaired by then state Senator Stuart Greenleaf of Montgomery County, a Republican, who recognized the importance of making it possible for low-income people to get counsel and through counsel, uh, a fair crack in the legal justice system. Um, and finally, um, I guess what I'd like, oh, and for that, Merrill, by the way, has been honored, but not enough for all of these things that she has done. So um, she was honored by the, um, when we won the ABA House and Tweet Award uh, for the work we've done on uh, the right to counsel e effort. She was honored by the Pennsylvania Legal Aid Network for their excellence award in 2014 for her work on the statewide coalition, which is a work in progress. And um, she's been honored for other things as well. But I just wanna finish by saying that there are five themes that I think of when I think of Merrill. I'm hoping I'm leaving enough time for, Ka for Kathy. Kathy will punish me later, but I'll, I'll live with it. Um, there are five themes that I wanna leave you with for uh, when you think about the incredible, and I do mean incredible work of Merrill Zeebe over all these years. The first is her commitment to justice in the legal system. Ironclad, total, complete commitment without second guessing in, in any way. The second is unfailing support of the disadvantaged clients and lawyers who we try to serve. Her support for, you can't tell the difference between Merrill's support for the clients versus her support for the lawyers and for the judges, all of whom are working to achieve access to justice. Third is her ultimate professionalism. Merrill is the ultimate, and I mean that, professional, by showing courtesy, respect, and empathy for clients, lawyers, and the courts at all times. And I can testify to this. I've worked closely with Merrill for many, many years. She's never exploded at anybody, even though I'm sure she must have wanted to every once in a while. And... Uh, <laughs> She's pointing at her husband. I'll just ignore that remark. The fourth theme is she, her ability to laugh. 
She's never taken something so seriously that she wants to just give up. She nods her head, laughs a little and says, well, not sure that was so fair, but let's move on. Um, and then finally, her perseverance, the determination to go back to the drawing board again and again and again until we get it right. All those qualities are things that Meryl Zeeby fully exemplifies and that we will miss dearly uh, in both the Delivery of Legal Services Committee, the Assets Justice Task Force, and all the other great things that Meryl has done for this association. For, so for those reasons, I want to thank you, and I'm going to turn it over to Kathy. Okay. So people have said a lot about Merrill. Um, I was supposed to talk about the task force, but hey, you guys have heard about the task force. It's fabulous. Um, I think it, um, it, the judges in the room should know that collaborating with public interest advocates is fun and constructive and brings on a lot of success. And we started this task force when the idea of civil Gideon was kind of a gleam in people's eye. Um, and now we've got it in 10 states and maybe five cities and Philadelphia has been a leader throughout this. So I just, I'll put it that way. So. Um, I don't want to talk long because one of the things about Meryl, um, it was the important thing about Meryl is that she does all this stuff behind the scenes that makes all of the volunteers and other people look good. And you don't get to hear from her much. And tonight I want to make sure she has enough time because we need to hear her speak. Meryl is, as people have said, Meryl's amazing. Meryl, first of all, Meryl is probably sort of known for being incredibly detail oriented. And I'll tell you, when I was running CLS and then I was running this task force and it was like, Meryl would be like calling me about the agenda for some meeting. And I was like, you know, do you know I have a hundred employees and budget problems and aboard this meeting tomorrow and clients in trouble and you want me to think about this agenda? But she would make me think about the agenda and she may, and she has done that all along. She does the hard work to make us look good. She keeps everybody coordinated. She writes up the reports. She writes up the proposals. She, uh, you know, my problem is that she's leaving and it's really, really scary, okay? Um, she made us look good. Um, and, but the important thing is that Meryl is not just about details and organization and getting the little stuff done. The truth is Meryl is an incredible strategic visionary advocate for change. And, uh, and I'm not sure I always realized that, but as you work with her, Meryl's got the long-term vision in mind and she's gonna make us get there. She's persistent and she's focused and she pushes and inspires everybody else. Um, she cares so much about change. People have mentioned what she did with the statewide effort, what she'd done with the local effort. Um, she's the She's certainly part of the reason the bar has won all those darn awards, right? Um, even to, she tells she tells us what to do. Even tonight, she kind of sent me the right documents to like prepare for the speech, and um, uh, you know, <laughs> and I, I I'm not necessarily finding the script. My printer didn't work, and everybody else has already said the stuff I was going to say. So I, I just and I want to turn it over to her. But I do. She she made me promise. One of the things she did today was that I wouldn't cry. And I'm tempted to cry because Meryl has become such a, um, she's been such an important colleague of mine, a confidant of mine, a partner in making things happen, um, in thinking about how to make things happen. Um, and mostly she's just been a fabulous friend. Um, I love her. And um, even when she's telling me what to do next, so. <laughs> Meryl, congratulations. We've got this award for her. Yeah. Pictures later. Wow. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I, I first want to um, just say um, how um, I, I want to congratulate Judge Hefley on um, being recognized tonight and it's so deserving. And I know when I first started the bar, Judge Hefley was at that table every month. Um, and you're just really 
one of the more dedicated and devoted members of the public interest section. So congratulations. And gee, George and Joe and Kathy and Kathy, you broke your promise. <laughs> um, thank you so, so much for your kind words and, and uh, generous remarks. And I wanna thank all of the members of the public interest section executive committee and awards committee that um, selected me for this award and um, to the DLSC members who nominated me, thank you. I am honored to be receiving this as we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the public interest section. And it is especially moving um, for the timing as I'm about to retire, which is all good. <laughs> When I began uh, working at the association 18 years ago, I knew that the Philadelphia uh, public interest legal community had an excellent national reputation. And I knew this from my work at Community Legal Aid Society in Wilmington. Um, and I knew it from my uh, summer internship that I spent at the Juvenile Law Center. But when I first started the reasons for this excellent reputation, quickly became apparent when, um, and it was demonstrated through the cohesiveness I saw in the DLSC committee and the powerful collaborative partnerships created by DLSC organizations with the private bar, government agencies, the judiciary, law schools, leadership of the bar, and most importantly, with each other. The accomplishments of this community in improving access to justice and the delivery of legal services during the past 30 years are truly remarkable and its national reputation for excellence has only increased. While I am personally touched by today's award, I do not consider it a personal achievement award. Instead, this award is dedicated to the members of DLSC, the Civil Gideon Task Force, and the public interest legal community at large for their tireless efforts over the past 30 years. My work has been just a small part of an incredible team effort by many volunteers who devoted countless hours in addition to working at their day jobs to create and implement meaningful initiatives that have had a profound impact on the lives of many. I want to highlight just a few. I am proud of everything that this community has done, but I am especially proud of the work done over the years by the task force and its housing working group to improve access to justice. And, while working, while working to create a right to counsel. We formed, we formed and created a landlord tenant help center in municipal court early on. And then we helped to, to create and advocate for the funding of the, Pencil, or the Philadelphia eviction prevention project. And then a small working group of the task force led by Ethan Fogel collaborated with Stout a global consulting firm at, as they developed on a pro bono basis, an economic impact study quantifying the benefits of providing representation to low income tenants. That study provided the foundation and the economic justification for Philadelphia becoming the fifth city in the nation to create a right to counsel by showing that the return on investment in the city would be over $12 for every dollar spent. Pretty amazing. As Kathy said, now there are 13 cities and three states that have these laws and the numbers are growing. And as she mentioned, when we first started in 2009, many people said, you'll never see that. Well, look at us today. <laughs> so, Right to counsel for tenants will begin implementation 
with the necessary funding starting next year. We now have robust help centers in all the major city courts. Our diversion program created last year is a national model and will hopefully be extended by city council through next year and permanently thereafter. And there are many, many other innovative changes and in civil justice reforms being explored and implemented. It is exciting to see what will come next. I also want to acknowledge um, the incredible reaction of this community to the pandemic. Our public interest legal organizations did not skip a beat in pivoting to virtual operations to meet their clients' needs. Additionally, during many months in 2020, 2021, our DLSC Management and Resource Development Subcommittee held weekly, I'm talking weekly Zoom meetings to provide a supportive forum for over 30 DLSC executive directors so they could exchange ideas on how to respond, share resources, work on issues of mutual concern, such as applying for PPP loans or how to best support their staff. These efforts illustrate the devotion of the directors to their mission, to their staff and to each other. The, and also the special cohesiveness and strength of this collaborative. And frankly, it explains why this community has been able to accomplish so much. It has been a privilege to work with you all, and I thank you all for your contributions. And while I cannot name all the many people who contributed, I do want to especially acknowledge the ex excellent leadership of DLSC by current co-chairs Joe, Anita Santos-Singh, and Brian, as well as the longstanding co-chairs of the task force, Kathy and Joe. And our key ad strategic advisors, uh, Len Reiser and Lou Ruley. I also want to acknowledge the unwavering support and contributions to these efforts by the Philadelphia Bar Association's leadership, our executive director, Harvey Hurdle, and the associ association's incredible staff. Finally, I wanna thank my husband, Dennis, uh, daughter-in-law. <laughs> he deserves, he deserves thanks. <laughs> daughter-in-law, Candace, and my uh, son, Brian, who, who couldn't be here today, and my childhood best friend, Valerie Burgess, as well as, I will add, as well as about nine or 10 of my law school cronies and dear friends who are watching virtually. And I thank you for your loving support. So in closing, I just wanna reiterate how grateful I am to be part of an incredible community that has accomplished so much and created real momentum for further change in this city. I am hopeful and excited that together this community will continue making a lasting impact. Thank you all. Thanks. One more round of applause for Meryl Zeeby. One more round of applause. And um, Meryl, congratulations again. You will be missed, but I know you will remain part of this community, and I can't wait to visit you down the shore during your deserved retirement. Um, I did just I did just invite myself. Yeah, I, I, I did. Um, 
I'd be remiss if we didn't mention another uh, longtime member of the Bar Association who is retiring this year, Charlie Klitsch. Charlie, can you stand up? Charlie is the Director of Public and Legal Services for the Bar Association and has played an incredible role in so many of the great things that the organization has done over the past few decades. And we're just very fortunate to have had, um, as I said earlier in my speech, such institutional knowledge uh, and such um, a brilliant work for those, for those times. So Charlie, you'll be missed as well. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Next, we have the presentation of the Lewis H. Pollock Award to the Honorable Marilyn Hefley, United States Magistrate Judge for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. The public interest section created this award in 2012 to honor the memory of Judge Pollock, a distinguished jurist who cared deeply about public service and access to justice, and who gave time and effort to support the public interest legal community through his work with the Philadelphia Bar Association. And this award is given annually to a jurist who embodies Judge Pollock's commitment to public service and serves as a recognition of both the legacy and leadership of Judge Pollock and of the service of the award winner. And here to present the award to Judge Hefley this evening is the Honorable Mitchell Goldberg, Judge of the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. Judge Goldberg. Good evening. The award to honor the memory of Judge Lewis H. Pollock is it's presented to a public servant who has given extraordinary amount of time and effort to support the public interest legal community. Now, I, I was privileged, as are many of my colleagues, to have sat with Judge Pollock while he was on our bench. And he had really one consistent theme. He used to say that any endeavor in any case that involves the public and public trust, no matter how small or insignificant, is still of monumental importance to the persons it affects. Necessarily, judges affect the lives of the public. And in our court, our magistrate judges it's their privilege to more directly interact with the public. They get to speak to the litigants a lot more than the district court judges and the third circuit judges do. So we are all so proud of our magistrate team. It really is a hall of fame legal lineup. And I don't think any of our magistrate judges would object to me stating. In fact, I think that they would probably join me in proclaiming that Judge Marilyn Hefley is the cream amongst the superstar magistrate crowd. Now, I, for one, um, I've gotten to know Marilyn, it's been my privilege, I, but I, 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 for one, had no idea the depth of her commitment to public service. And I'm not gonna read all of this, but this is her public service resume. As Judge Strawbridge told me, I'm gonna run out of highlighter, but I'm just gonna talk a, a little bit about a few things that she's done real quick. Board member, Community Legal Services, Philadelphia. Co-chair, Philadelphia Bar Association, Women's Rights Committee. Leadership Council, Community Legal Services of Philadelphia. Co-chair, Philadelphia Bar Association, Andrew Hamilton Ball big fundraiser for the Bar Association, um, Chair, American Heart Association, Southeastern Pennsylvania Advocacy Committee, Board Member, March of Dimes, Member, Philadelphia Bar Association Pro Bono Task Force, Co-Chair, Women's Rights Committee, Executive Committee Member, Public Interest Section, She's been involved in defense council groups and a board member of volunteer lawyers for the arts. And I've read about 10% of her accomplishments in public service. Harry Truman once famously said, it's amazing what one can accomplish if you don't care who gets the praise. 
and Judge Heffley epitomizes that. Judge Heffley has made all of these contributions without wanting the spotlight. She's done it all under the radar and with little fanfare. Which brings me to Judge Heffley's accomplishments and contributions to our court as a federal judge. Now I'll reveal a little secret here. Sometimes the work of a federal judge, it can be stressful. And dare I say, some of us can get, I don't know, a little cranky sometimes, all right? Not Judge Heffley, never. She's the opposite. She understands all of the time that to serve as a judge is a privilege and an honor. And most of all with Judge Heffley, she understands that public service is a joy. I remember one time I called her and asked her to mediate a very old, very complicated, very boring landfill toxic leak case involving multiple plaintiffs and many, many insurance companies and thus many, many lawyers. Her reaction, you would have thought I asked her or I was calling to tell her that I, she just wanted a free trip to Hawaii. She is upbeat. She is positive all of the time. She's an expert mediator who the lawyers and the litigants love and respect. She brightens every meeting and every courtroom and every room that she enters with her megawatt smile. Her constant positive attitude in what can be a demanding job, well, it's, it's infectious. Judge Heffley has lifted the stature of our court, the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, by her tireless public service. And on behalf of all of our colleagues on our court, I say to Judge Heffley, we are so proud that you are on our team. And Judge Pollack would surely approve of this. So Judge Heffley, it's my privilege to present you with the Lewis H. Pollack Public Service Award. Well, first, I just want to say I have so many friends in this room, and it's just a joyous and wonderful evening. And I'm so glad that you could all be here tonight uh, to share uh, all the festivities. Uh, and Judge Goldberg, wherever you got to, there you are. I want to thank you so much for those lovely comments. Uh, uh, and even though you exaggerated quite a bit, um, I'll still take the compliments. And I'd like to also extend my congratulations to Merle Zeeby for her award, Bending the Arc, tonight. Merle, Merle is terrific. And uh, Merle and I have worked together for so many years, and it's such a, a privilege to be able to share this special occasion uh, with her tonight. Uh, so I wanted to make sure she knew how proud I, I am of her as well as you are. Um, to say I was surprised that I was selected as the uh, Pollock awardee this year is really an understatement. I got the call from Melissa Manser and I thought she had the wrong number. Uh, 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 and literally I started to cry because I was totally shocked and uh, really honored that, uh, uh, that I would be considered for such a prestigious award. You know, it's hard to imagine how anyone can embody the commitment to public service at the level that Judge Pollack did. And I remember when um, Judge Pollack was involved with the award, we used to laugh about we had to keep him. You know, he went on too long. We had to keep him on script. Uh, but he was truly, you know, a consummate uh, public servant as uh, are the past Pollock awardees. Many of my colleagues are here tonight, Betsy Hay, uh, Dave Strawbridge. Uh, we don't have uh, Tim Rice here tonight. Uh, and then we have, of course, the other judges, uh, Judges Powell, Simmons, uh, Rizzo, 
with Skippers and McKee and Space. So it's a hard lineup to, to uh, I call them the pantheon of the public interest heroes. That's how I see them. Uh, so I want to extend my heartfelt thanks to the Philadelphia Bar Association for honoring me. And uh, I'm especially humbled to have been selected uh, by the P Pollock Award Committee members and through the efforts of my friends and colleagues. So thank you so much for that. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of you that are here tonight to celebrate this joyous occasion uh, with me and also with Merle. Uh, my desire and dedication to helping the marginalized people uh, groups uh, in our society, I think stems back uh, to my childhood. And my maternal grandparents were immigrants who came to this great country in the early 1900s. And literally, they, they didn't have much of anything but the clothes on their back. And I'm not exaggerating. And uh, believe me, I heard about that my entire life <laughs> and about how lucky I was to have everything that I had. And uh, although my grandparents, they were discriminated against. Uh, I was taught that all human beings were bound together by certain principles of freedom, equality, and justice that drew no distinction based on race, class, faith, gender, or background. And that lesson was reinforced on a daily basis by my parents, who uh, had no tolerance for any form of discrimination whatsoever. When I graduated from law school, I had a bit of a dilemma. Uh, I started working at Reed Smith. It's a large law firm. Uh, how in the heck am I gonna to contribute to the public interest? Uh, well, as luck would have it, uh, my mentor is sitting here tonight, Len Bernstein. Uh, <laughs> convinced me as a long, young lawyer that I should become involved in the Philadelphia Bar Association. And, I was so naive and stupid that he convinced me to run for the Board of Governors, even though I had no contacts whatsoever in the Bar Association. But that was my entree. And from there, I, I enjoyed getting involved in, all, in so many committees within the Philadelphia Bar Association that it just catapulted from there. And uh, I was lucky enough over the years to become the co-chair of the public interest section uh, a longstanding member of the Public Interest Section Executive Committee, and I co-chaired uh, and chaired many of the uh, committees within the Bar Association, did a lot of pro bono work, and, as, and I'm especially proud of my service on the Community Legal Services and Public Interest Law Center of Philadelphia boards. Along the way, I've forged great friendships. Many of my friends are here tonight and worked with outstanding public interest advocates such as Kathy Carr, Lou Rooley, Joe Sullivan, and Jenny Clark, who's not here tonight, uh, just to name a few. But there's still much, so much more work to do. So in closing, I just want to say I'm so grateful again for this award and hope that will inspire others to hear the call of public service and equal justice for all. Thank you very much. And folks, you should all have uh, champagne, champagne in front of you. Um, and so right now, um, I want to lead us in a, in a very brief toast to Meryl Zeeby, to Judge Marilyn Heffley, um, incredibly deserving award winners uh, of the Bending the Arc Award and the Pollock Award. It is an honor to be honoring them on the 30th anniversary of this section. So cheers to Meryl, cheers to Judge Heffley, and cheers to 30 years of the public interest section.
And we have two final orders of business tonight. And then you are mercifully done with me in this role. It's now time for the drawing of the Judge Leon Higginbotham Fellowship. And the Higginbotham Fellowship is awarded annually to a legal services agency and is used for the purpose of paying a law student intern during the following summer period. And those of you who have been to these dinners before know, it's a random drawing. It's a random drawing. So our incoming chair, Ebony Griffin, will now pull the winner. All right. And the winner is Mazzoni Center's Legal Services Program. Congratulations to the, to the Mazzoni Center, congratulations. It's now a privilege to introduce my friend who you just met briefly, Ebony Griffin, staff attorney at the Public Interest Law Center and the incoming chair of the Public Interest Section. So a round of applause for Ebony. The only negative thing I have to say about Ebony is that she has continued to collect cats against my fairly explicit advice to the contrary. Are we up to three or so two? Two, okay, two cats. But in every other respect, Ebony is an extraordinary lawyer, a persistent and effective advocate against environmental racism, and the city's foremost champion of community gardens, community land, and their keepers. And, And most importantly, she is a smart and empathetic colleague to her, uh, to folks in this community and her coworkers at the Public Interest Law Center. And the section is in much better hands with you, Ebony. And it is an honor to hand over this chairperson seat to you. And so please welcome 2022 Chair of the Public Interest Section, Ebony Griffin. Thank you, George. I am confident that that is the nicest thing I've ever heard George say about me in person. Um, George and I were work spouses for four years, four years at the law center. So we have a, a very special relationship um, and I'm happy to be um, his uh, successor in this event. Thank you so much. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. This has been an amazing event. I'm very excited to be here. As George mentioned, uh, my name is Ebony Griffin and I am the incoming chair of the public interest section of the Philadelphia Bar Association. So just by way of a little bit of background, um, since 2017, I have been a staff attorney at the Public Interest Law Center. Very happy to see our brand new executive director, Brenda Marrero here today. And I focus on environmental justice. So what a year it has been. I'm sure you can all relate, but I started 2021 thinking that this would be the year, right? This would be the year that things return to normal. I remember waking up on January 1st with a renewed sense of purpose and vigor, excited to return to society and creature comfort. So, you know, like going, getting massages and going to the movies and, you know, hanging out with friends and happy hours after work. Very quickly, that little idealistic bubble popped and I found that what was possible was now at odds with what I needed. When I moved to Philadelphia from the District of Columbia in 2017, I came here knowing no one, nothing about the city, its varied and robust communities or its values. But I dove in head first, excited to start a new life where I was passionate about the work I was doing and living my best life, so to speak. I developed a network of close friends and mentors throughout the public interest community who I could rely on, both for advice and much needed social interaction. And then March 2020 happened. And all of what that I thought that I'd acquired was suddenly gone. For me, COVID-19 brought many things, but it took away just as much. It brought the realization that connections and relationships should be intentional. And it introduced us to technology that made maintaining those connections possible. But in many ways, it also took away the community I'd built. 
It took away my ability to practice meaningful self-care. It also inserted loss, massive loss, fear, and trauma. I know this sounds really sad, but I promise it gets less sad as we go. <laughs> Many of us enter the public interest space because we have personal connections to the clients we represent. And sometimes we hold those interactions with us long after the workday has ended. Self-care and downtime were crucial components to me being an effective advocate for my clients. On top of that, COVID also highlighted the deeply ingrained injustices so present in our society with many of our clients and ourselves suffering unexpected consequences with no clear path to relief. But, as we close out 2021 and ring in 2022, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic that science is developing tools to allow us to re-engage with each other in a meaningful way. So next year, I want to focus on a few things, community, self-care and mental health, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. So one, community. I wanna bring the community back into the public interest section. <laughs> The section should be a network of public interest attorneys working together to make society better and also supporting each other as we engage in the myriad battles we face as practitioners. Self-care. I also want the section to be a resource for those of us who may be struggling in different ways. Um, and one of the ways that I hope to do that is to reinvigorate the mentoring and networking aspects of the section. And finally, DEI. We all know that the representation of attorneys of color in the public interest space is among the lowest in the industry. And there are reasons for that, some more complex than others. <clears throat> and this is also not a problem that we can solve in one term. It's gonna take a concerted and collaborative effort to fully incorporate principles of diversity, equity, inclusion into the public interest loss section um, industry before we really see the fruits of that, that labor. But I would like for the, the section to commit to that process by designing a DEI framework that one day will lead to a di more diverse work workforce. So with all of that being said, thank you all again for allowing me to address you today. And I look forward to spending the next year together in furtherance of our collective missions. Thank you.